Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss the role of the Chief Data Officer in business transformation. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And now let me introduce to you the speaker for the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with this, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. <clears throat> Donna, hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thank you. And thanks for the great introduction. And thanks for everyone joining the webinar. It's always good to see some familiar names on the call. So let's jump right into it. So um, if, if you are new to this webinar series, um, and this is your first time joining us, uh, this is a series. Uh, Dataversity does keep all of the previous um, sessions on their website. We also link to it from our website our global data strategy website. So if any of those previous ones are of interest to you, you can catch them. Um, and then as uh, Shannon mentioned, we always, one of the, the biggest questions is always, can I get this slide? Can I get the recordings after? And yes, all of that will be available. Um, and so what we're covering this time uh, is the role of the chief data officer in, in business transformation. And, and what does that mean? I mean, I think what, and if you if you have joined my webinars before, um, you know, I, I've said this before, that one of the reasons I'm still in data is, is that, that this intersection of data and business opportunity. I mean, my first degree with econom economics, I was going to go work on Wall Street, and then I fell in love with data. And now you don't have to choose, right? Having that business focus for data, uh, and maybe it's always been the case, but it's even more so the case. And so this emerging role of the chief data officer, how does this evolve in this idea of the data-driven enterprise? And I think we'll talk about it as we go through, you know, is is the, the chief data officer the, the leader of this business transformation? Is the chief data officer more of a technical role? Is it a combination of all of the above? Do we not Wait, no yet because this is a new role we'll kind of talk through that and if you are a chief data officer and have thoughts you know please do i know the chat um and the the conversations at dataversity are never shy <laughs> so we'd love to hear people's um opinions and then we also will have q a at the end so <clears throat> again i have showed this slide before because i love it um i i what i love about this slide and we'll show a, um a lot of you know, the data in this presentation from folks like Dataversity, and it's no nothing against Dataversity, I'm a fan, but if Dataversity says data is important, well, gee, there's no surprise there, right? What I like about this is that this is from the World Economic Forum, and what they're saying is, is that um, data is now more valuable than physical, tangible products that, that organizations you know, sell in the industry, and, and their examples here, there's a little bit of an outdated slide, but I think the message still holds that if you look at the top publicly traded companies, if you look at market cap right back in 2013, really the focus there was a product focus, right? They sold stuff, right? Exxon, you know, oil and gas, Walmart sold things. And you could you could argue, well, isn't, isn't um, you know, Amazon, don't they sell things? Yes, but the focus is on data, right? One of the reasons Amazon has grown um, is its focus on data. You could say Alphabet, which is the parent company of, of Google, literally is a data company, right? Um, so I find this interesting that it's the World Economic Forum. I think us in the data world are probably not surprised by that. So the fact that there's now a role called the chief data officer is not necessarily a surprise in this world where everything is data. I mean, uh, um, uh, an interesting kind of anecdote from one of our customers um, is well you know when you've heard me speak on some of these webinars if you've joined us in the past of where anything even something like master data management that can seem really techy really is a business 
driver. And we have one of our clients that's actually started their master data management effort for both their product and customer. And they said the reason for that is because they are looking to be acquired. They, they know that their, their goal is to sell the company in, in two to three years. And they said, data is our biggest asset and, and data on our customers, our, our products and our suppliers is, is one of the biggest values of the company. And if we don't have that clean, we're not going to get the right valuation for our company. And I love that because it was so explicit. And that was the CEO and the board and the C-level folks saying that. And that was their driver for master data management. So, so, so not necessarily a technical reason at all. It was a business reason. And so I, I think that just speaks to, you know, the slide and why does Amazon, you know, do so well? They have excellent product master, uh, right? You know, someone bought this. Can they, they've also bought, you know, you other customers who bought this, you may be interested. All those algorithms, all the data that allows them to do that really is their driver, not the fact that, you know, the necessarily the products they sell themselves. So I, I thought that was a great way to start the webinar because it really speaks to the why we have this role of something like a chief data officer. It's not strange to have a chief financial officer, or a chief, you know, head of HR, because of course we have people, of course we have budgets. It should just be normal, I think, as, as this evolves to have someone looking at the data. I also wanna make the distinction um, between when we talk about being data-driven, we've all heard that, right? We probably wouldn't be on this webinar, but I like to make the distinction between business optimization, which is being that everyone wants to be the, the data-driven company and business transformation where you're really becoming a data company, right? And, and what's the difference there? You could argue that you know business optimization through data we've been doing forever, right? We've been using data to improve efficiency and eliminate manual efforts and, and grow revenue through better marketing. And, you know, I think we can do it better now, like that last bullet, data-driven product development. Well, we probably always wanted to know how customers are using our product. I mean, we had surveys and things, but now, especially digitally enabled products, you literally know how people are using it and you can really feed that back into product development. Um, you know, I... <laughs> I'm a nerd. I'm a data nerd. I'm proud of that. I'll wear the t-shirt. I actually do. But, but, uh, but, but, you know, if you think of this, I, I know I took a trip years ago to, to Egypt and you look at the hieroglyphs and you go, wow, that just felt so long ago. Uh, when you look at it to me, I said, wow, those are early dashboards. A lot of the, a lot of the hieroglyphs were how much grain we sold. And, you know, a lot of early writing sort of came from things like basic data of, of again, trade and counting and, and sales. So again, we've been using data since the beginning of time to sell things, to market things, to understand our environment. That, of course, we can do a lot better now. I'm not saying, oh, let's carve, carve into stone our sales results. Um, we, we have dashboards for that now. Um, but th that idea of using data um, to improve your business is not more important now, but it's kind of a core. You know, I would I kind of summarize that of how do we do what we do, but, but do it better, right? Um, business transformation, on the other hand, I do think is fairly new. That's literally becoming a data company where data is the product. And, you know, we've heard a lot about business modern, that data monetization, I can talk, um, where there's entirely new business models. Think of an Uber, right? Where, you know, is Uber a taxi company or is it a data company with some cars around it? One could argue, right? And there's a lot of, lot of these disruptive business models really are digital models often and, and digital is driven by data and we'll talk about that. So I think both are valuable, both are important. I do like to make this distinction too because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so, so many companies now are looking to do data. It doesn't mean you have to be a data company. I have worked with some organizations that, that literally you're either doing a spinoff or, or, or having new branches based on a data company, but you can also just optimize the company you have. <laughs> These are, it, it, it doesn't mean that you have to do a business transformation that would make yourself only a data, a data company. Um, <clears throat> sorry, a little bit of coughing here today. Um, so this is, um, I thought this was an interesting graph. So uh, global data strategy and data diversity partner each year on a trends and data management survey. This is a little bit of a sneak peek um, into the 2024 survey, but fairly similar to other surveys um, that have been done uh, kind of in other, um, uh, other years. So it's not too much of a surprise. Um, but the question we asked are, what are your main business goals and drivers for using data management in your organization? The, the first one, gaining insights through reporting and analytics has been the number one answer in the past. I think we've been doing this, I don't know, six or seven years now, and not too much of a surprise to, again, 
um, to me be, because a lot of folks sort of attribute data to, to analytics, right? So I don't think that's crazy. That's almost your classic um, on the previous slide. Sorry, I'm having a little issue with my slides. Uh, well, remember the previous slide, um, where it's basically, you know, trying to tr um, optimize your business, that's really you're gaining insights through reporting analytics often. That often leads to things like saving cost and increasing efficiency. Um, so no surprise there. But if you look at that number three, so over 60% so over of organizations actually said they were using data for digital transformation. To me, when we kind of differentiated between business optimization and business transformation. A lot of that business transformation is, is that digital. So I, I was sort of interested to see that. That's definitely in the top three. I think some of the others will, will kind of, you, know, you can read through. Um, to me, those kind of fell in the business optimization category, either on the kind of offense or, you know, the carrot or defense, which is the stick, right? Complying with regulations, that's kind of more of a defense, but absolutely important if you're in a regulated industry, finance, healthcare, um, things like that, reducing risk. Uh, but you'll see some of these other customer satisfaction, revenue and growth, one, one that I really like to see is that second one from the bottom, um, <clears throat> excuse me, proving outcomes. We so often, uh, and nothing nothing against it, but kind of use examples like customer and product, you know, partly because I think we can all relate to it. Um, and that is a big part of the companies that are using data. But but I like that the focus on improving outcomes. Um, it could it be healthcare outcomes, could it be educational outcomes? We're working with some non nonprofits and their dashboards are basically you know, longitudinal analysis for when we help somebody, we help a family, how well is that family doing in five years, 10 years from now, right? So that's data-driven transfer, you know, in optimization of their outcomes. Uh, it doesn't always have to be dollars and cents or widgets that you're selling. So I, I kind of like that that kind of bubbled up to the top 10. This is just the top 10 of all the answers. So I thought that was interesting. So, but let's drill down a little bit into this digital transformation, because I do think that is some of the excitement in the industry and it's something that is a bit different than, you know, the hieroglyphs <laughs> back in uh, Egypt. So um, what is digital transformation? <clears throat> and so I took this from Gartner. Um, I often use their information technology glossary. I think it's fairly decent. Um, and they kind of define it in several ways. One, I, I like the, the bold in the first uh, bullet, which is that invention of new digital business models, right? That could be Amazon, the fact that they're selling things online, um, you know, in, in ways we never could. Their supply chain optimization and the way they can deliver products so quickly. It could be the Ubers of the world, right? So think uh, it could be some of the fintech, right, that I could do you know, trade uh, stocks from my cell phone in my living room. <laughs> so much of this that in a way we take for granted now um, is really a, a, a new business model and keeps evolving in you know, ways we can we can digitize things we never thought before. Uh, the, the second one, I actually take a little bit of umbrage with. In fact, I added my little color commentary of sick there <laughs> in my edit when they said public sector organizations also refer to, quote, modest initiatives like putting digital ser services online or legacy modernization. I, I think those are absolutely valid things. The fact that that's modest, I'm not so sure. Every time I renew my driver's license in my pajamas and don't have to go to the, the registry of motor vehicles, um, I appreciate whoever did that and, and put those services online uh, and having worked with some government agencies that that's not a small task. So I think, yes, we may take it for granted, um, but I don't think it's a modest initiative. I think it's actually amazing that we can, I still appreciate that. I, I came from an unnamed state where you should take at least a day to sit there in line. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember that. And I think some states still have it uh, to, to change your driver's license. So I think it's it's you know sort of reminds me to the dot com when folks say oh yeah that dot dot com boss bust I'm like yeah no one sells anything online you know who's who's heard of anything like Amazon.com. so yes there was a stock crash but the fact that you know the dot com era is now just business as usual and so I think pretty soon um, if we're not there already this idea of digital transformation is just business as usual. And since I'm quoting Gartner, we may all kind of know of the Gartner hype cycle, right? Where there's sort of inflated expectations and then trough of disillusionment because we can't digitize everything in life. And then there's kind of that, that flattening out where it just becomes the normal way of doing things. And I think we're close there, but I think I'm always surprised with things that are now digitized that used to be kind of brick and mortar before. Um, so to me, that's, again, if we have those two categories of business optimization and business transformation, 
digital transformation, as the name suggests, uh, very much sits in that transformation category. So <clears throat> nothing against <laughs> business optimization. I do think that's the main bread and butter of a lot of the data-driven op op um, opportunities. And really when we're kind of sitting in the world of the chief data officer, really should be top of mind. Am I, when you kind of think in the different categories of how we might optimize data or kind of drive value, there can be others, but generally I, I see them following into these four categories. And, and often, and if you are a chief data officer, you're probably tasked with some sort of ROI, whether it's explicit numbers and KPIs, um, or just, you know, anecdotal, how are we doing? How have you improved things, right? So this might help you in terms of thinking of, do I have something in each of these buckets? Other buckets I haven't thought of. Decreasing costs, I think, especially when you're looking to actually quantify a return on investment or ROI, um, is, is often the easier one to, to kind of show. Um, and and don't get me started, I'll, I'll fight you in the hallway, but what we so often get kind of the unfair connotation of things like data governance, which we'll talk more about in a bit, as being extra and burdensome and, and you know, it's gonna take us longer and harder. And it's absolutely the opposite. Generally organizations that have good governance, things are streamlined. And yes, there's a ramp up time as there is with anything, but generally the companies that do have good governance and good data management in place are much more streamlined. So. Often when we work with companies to kind of show that, you'll show how much extra time either actually cleaning data, like, you know, actual data management tasks that take a lot extra, um, cleaning data, manually integrating data, the ubiquitous spreadsheet, right? Or I think more powerfully, those inefficient business processes, because you don't have good product, um, you know, good, good data management. It could be, gosh, the number of organizations um, that I work with that are multi-billion dollar, you know, <laughs> household names that still have their master data management either for their product or their key locations in a spreadsheet. I'm no longer surprised by that. I'm, I'm disheartened by that, but um, I think there's a lot of optimization. Um, compare that to something like an Amazon where they absolutely have very good uh, product data and customer data and things like that. Um, and then, you know, the, the impacts of data quality, you know, and physical mailings aren't as possible popular anymore, but uh, often when you do need to mail something, it's a packet or a big thing because it's a legal requirement. And just we have in incorrect addresses. How many people are we actually spending money to send things to that are going to the wrong place? I mean, that's a small one, right? But that's an easy one to quantify. So I think the more you can think of that as, you know, in, in the CDO role as how do I actually show how much more efficiency we're driving through things like data management? Because... I think us in the data management world, that might just be obvious to us, but from an average person running the business, do they understand maybe some of these inefficiencies they may see and feel that are driven back to things like master data and metadata and lineage and things that we take for granted. So telling that story um, is a big part of kind of understanding that. Increasing revenue, I mean, a lot, so much of what you're trying to do to optimize the organization, you know, price optimization, um, you know, is generally built off of historical data. And if you don't have great historical data, your price optimization isn't going to be optimized, right? Um, improve marketing campaigns. How do I truly understand the customer if I don't have good data? Um, you know, data-driven recommendation engines. You know, I mentioned Amazon. You'd think they're probably paying me, but they're not. It's just a common one that everyone understands. Um, I'll, I'll use another example. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, that we worked with an online, a small online insurance company, um, and given their size, they were doing amazing things with um, just kind of taking the the leads they had and and using data driven historical um, patterns to predict the best. You know, I'm going to get a thousand leads for this online insurance. Who are the people I really should call that are most likely to be benefited? from our insurance and most likely to buy. And that was a small company doing amazing things and growing their revenue. And they showed the numbers from that actually driven by data. All right, so this isn't, just, I, I use the big ones as an example because we're all familiar with them. Absolutely doesn't have to be the big ones, which leads to that second bullet, the last bullet and under the increasing revenue, <clears throat> something like grant writing. It might be a small nonprofit, but can I show the benefit of what we're doing in my nonprofit um, to kind of get those grants and things like that. So those are kind of the, the carrots, which is why they're in green. Um, I'm gonna mute myself and just fully cough so I don't keep doing it. <laughs>
All right, hopefully that cleared it up. Um, <clears throat> but the red ones, reducing risk, right? Often we do things like uh, data management because we have to. There's GDPR, uh, HIPAA, you know, a lot of the other, um, if you're in the financial services, a lot of regulations there. Uh, product traceability, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a restaurant or I'm a food um, chain. Do I, can I understand all of that? Um, and then reputation, right? That's one we maybe not think of to quantify, uh, but how many of us have gotten, you know, a, a, a marketing campaign that either d doesn't um, apply to you or has your wrong name? Um, and, and again, you're you're trying to, you know, impress the company customer by customizing it, and you've gone the other way. Um, I actually sent one to my own team the other day. I think AI is only making this worse. I got one that said, yeah, I see you work at Global Data Strategy. Um, and to help optimize your business, we have premium soy sauce that's really <laughs> helps you drive growth. And I'm like, wow, I'm really can really interested in that algorithm that linked data management consultancy with soy sauce. It was premium soy sauce, but I'm still not sure. So again, I'm not sure what they were trying to achieve, but it did not make them look, I'm actually a fan of soy sauce, but I'm not going to buy that brand. Right? <laughs> I was like, what are they doing there, right? Or, or worse, could there be a data breach, right? You don't want to be the, the brand in the news um, that didn't trust their customers' data. Um, and now in the age of social media, do you know what folks are, are saying about you, either positive or negative, right? That's a great analytical use case. So anyway, a lot of really good, either concrete, quantifiable, or great anecdotes, or I hate to say gut feel, but right, these are all kind of areas uh, where data can help optimize. So um, one more example, um, in this idea of transforming business with data, and again, not paid by Uber or Amazon, but those are kind of ones we, we know. And Uber is almost a classic example of disrupting an industry through data, right? So again, is data, is Uber a taxi company um, or is Uber a data company that happens to use cars as one of its options? And I would argue the latter, right? Um, and I, again, I, I'm, I I still ride taxis sometimes in an airport. I think it's a lot easier actually. Um, and I'm still surprised that most of them didn't take anything from the Uber model. I mean, I think I know why it's hard to get there. Uber looks easy. There's a whole lot of data behind it. But, you know, couldn't a taxi do, do some of these things because you have an app for your taxi company, right? But they don't. Um, but when you look at Uber, all of the data that that consolidates and, um, you know, I have not worked with Uber, but I've done a lot of reading and gone to some of their workshops and things, actually. Um, and how much they really aggregate through, you know, speaking of the airport, they know when from the data, when airlines are going to arrive. They can predict user volumes. They can help set pricing for good or bad now, based on that. They have GPS tracking for real-time data streaming. They have algorithms that support that. Um, they have user rating, right? It's really sort of amazing, but it's mostly the data platform. Again, they don't even own cars. Right? So, um, so that's a great example. And when you think, I mean, I am, I'm a data nerd, but I'm also kind of a business nerd and I'm super fascinated by that. When you think a lot of the MBA programs or the startups or the innovative, generally they, they have a lot of ideas about data, either it's a hackathon at kind of the local level or folks that look at the data and say, what kind of business should I should I start? Um, Zappos, for example, the guy who started Zappos didn't love shoes. <laughs> he saw a market for something through data and usage and patterns that he could build a business around. So I think, again, was the person who ran Uber really excited about taxis um, or did they see a business opportunity that could be enabled through data? And I think that's what's super exciting in this idea of digital transformation, that this is literally an example of digital transformation, maybe a more extreme example. And they're happening all the time. FinTech and SureTech, again, they're almost getting old because we're just so used to them. But it's amazing of how much now could be, you know, entirely new business models based on data. So the other part of this is that it's an evolution. Data management is an evolution and the business support of data is an evolution, right? And, and so this is sort of based on um, a maturity assessment framework we use in our practice, but it's basically similar to many others, kind of based a lot of on the data management DEMA framework. Um, but I kind of just wanted to walk through this because I think especially if you are in the CDO role, kind of helps put things in perspective as well. So level one, we call tactical. Uh, we see a lot of level one companies almost by design because they're in need of help, right? You might rec recognize this in yourself. Um, 
because uh, we've all been there at some point, right? Because it's a, again, it's an evolution. I'd love to use data for pricing or customer segmentation or grant writing, but it's a mess. And we're actually spending more time managing the data than using it for strategic advantage. I'm seeing a lot of companies here, to be fair. Um, one of the reasons, again, I, I love what I do is just the diversity of companies we work with. It used to only be insurance companies, you know, financial institutions, government that kind of got or had the budgets to get data. Now it's everyone. I've worked with museums and stores and manufacturing companies and everything across the globe because everyone's doing it. As a result, <clears throat> a lot of people are starting kind of starting from scratch. So we're seeing a lot of level ones. It's hard when we do do a, a maturity assessment um, to hear that you're a level one because generally those are people working really, really hard. Are you telling me? I spent all weekend cleaning up the customer data for this campaign that knocked it out of the park and I'm a level one. I'm like, well, that's exactly why you're a level one. You spent all weekend doing it. It could be better. It could be easier and it could be automated. You're, you're awesome, but the environment isn't awesome to support you, if that makes sense. So level two is often kind of a, a stepping to stone for, for going further. And again, a, a lot of us CDOs, um, when you, you might come in a level one, kind of how do I get started? This seems overwhelming. I'm now CDO of a multi-billion dollar company that looks great on paper and we're running on spreadsheets. <laughs> um, so uh, how do I get that? Of, often starting with a really targeted project um, that can pilot the right way of doing things. I'm always cautious of the word quick win. It doesn't mean it's something you're going to throw away. It's the first step in a foundation. So let's do it right and let's do it with a particular project and show that show that benefit. Let's work on our product data for pricing or pick something small, locations of our stores so we can do better predictive modeling on where to build a store or something that shows that success. So you can really get to this enterprise level. To me, this is the unfortunately it can almost be the boring one. Um, we're just running really smoothly and we're optimized. Often when we come into a company and we kind of start to ask our questions and, 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 you know, do you ever have trouble finding the, the data you need? No, I go in the warehouse or I, I go to the trusted data set library. And do you ever have trouble on not understanding what metrics mean? No, I go to the glossary and it's defined. Well, what if you don't agree? Well, we go through governance and we create a new definition. We agree to it and it's published. Big deal. And I say, you don't realize how lucky you are right? <laughs> because it just seems so banal and boring. And things are like, like, like life, you don't appreciate electricity until it's shut off. Right. You don't realize how things are streamlined. So I think that's from level three to five, I think is where companies want to be. I would see level three is really, again, back to that optimization or transformation, this is sort of your classic starting to be optimized. You're, you're streamlining your company, you're efficient, um, and you're really, you know, again, not to overuse the word optimized, but you're optimizing things. Strategic, uh, I still think that's sort of the transition between optimized and trend, uh, optimizing and transforming, where that's really where you have a culture of decision-making, where not only do you do have the dashboards, um, but you're actually using them. That's that data-driven culture. Think of that insurance company I mentioned where sales reps actually made their sales call decisions based on data. And when you're in the meeting, you know, I'm a, I'm a widget company. We're going to decide what widgets we're going to launch next year. Someone asks, well, what does the data say? What customer, what are customer preferences and how do we know? And, and again, that might feel like, well, doesn't everyone do that once you're at that level? But no, not everyone does. So that's truly starting to use data for strategic advantage, not just, you know, maybe at the enterprise level, it could be. Well, the auditors need metrics and we produce the metrics and they're always right. And we do it and that's fine. Strategic is I'm actually using it for, you know, again, strategic advantage. Transformational, that's where data is your business. That's your Uber, right? Um, and the whole value proposition of the org is based on data, right? Um, again, I used Uber, but, you know, the, the other company I talked with that was going to get acquired, they realized, they, actually, they were an events company, kind of like a, kind of like a data diversity, but for non-data things, you know, fashion shows and things like that. And they realized like to optimize that business is data. And if we want to sell this business someday, we need really good data. And so I think even though they weren't quote the data company, they were a data a company where their, their data was so embedded to the value of the company that was top of mind. I mean, think of Bloomberg, right? I mean, yeah, you could say they're a financial company or a, you know, but, but, it's their data. They actually have monetized data and the Bloomberg data platform, right? And so many more companies are kind of going towards that. I think that idea of how do I transform my business through data is, is really attractive to folks. So as a CDO, 
you might think kind of where are we on this trajectory um any c level I, you know i've seen a lot of articles on you know why do cdos what well, articles love to be negative anyway but why do cdos fail after 18 months and why did, well any c level role is under the gun <laughs> under the microscope and if you're not offering value and showing it as a trajectory like this it is going to be a concern, right? So I think this is top of mind of where are you now and how do you realistically get there um, and tell that story. You might have, um, and this is the challenge for a CDO, you might have been hired into a company that thinks they're a five and you look at the data and you're a one. <laughs> how do you say that message? Well, you have to show that message by getting a lot of those project level wins and building there as you go because you don't get a lot of benefit by saying how bad things are. That's just life, right? You have to just build it, you know, and build it and show those successes as you go. So just building off on this um, maturity assessment, again, we use this for our own clients. One of the things, even if this weren't a CDO webinar, we say anyway, if you look at kind of that enterprise to strategic level, when when does it make sense to have a, a chief data officer? Um, often, I mean, at any level, I suppose, but we often have a company that's just heard of data and they're just starting. And they say, what's the first thing I need to do? Should I hire a chief data officer? And I kind of say, again, not to offend any chief data officers on the call, but don't waste your money yet. Like you probably just need a good project manager or then maybe a data governance lead. And then, then you can start thinking about optimizing, but you, you, you know, you, you could have a great chief, a data officer that comes in, cleans up house, you know, gets from level one to four, that's fine. But I think that shouldn't be the first thing you're thinking of necessarily. It could be some very tactical hires of maybe a data architect, you know, really look carefully um, at your team, because if you're a CDO, you know this, you, a CDO can't build an empire on their own. You need a team of architects and engineers and data analysts and all of those folks around them. So it may make sense to help, you know, build some of that team before you get to that chief data officer role. Um, so you've, if you've seen my webinar, if you've seen this framework before, this is our data strategy framework. One of the reasons I included here, because a goal of the CDO really is that data strategy and what makes the role of a chief data officer a bit complex um, and worthy of the title is that it's all of this. And I'll talk more about this in, in the next few slides. That's why it's a challenge to hire for and um, a challenge to succeed because not only do you need that top-down vision of business strategy, of I, I, I know well, it could be, I, I know I want to transform the widget industry by making the first digital widget and being the leader in the market because we have awesome data. Great. But how do you get there? <laughs> you actually have to deliver. So you also need to understand whether your hands to keyboard coding, you're probably not or shouldn't be, but to understand that bottom up of the, 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 the data ecosystems and how you manage security and data integration and data quality and master data warehousing, all of those things, a lot of the data diversity folks know. And then to add to that complexity, this idea of data governance and collaboration of how do we get that data driven culture and the people process policy around data to make all that sing. And that is your remit at a holistic level from the CHISA office data officer and getting that right requires a lot of different skill sets. Can absolutely happen, it's happening more and more, but it is a journey um, and it requires a lot of different things. So what does the CDO role look like? Um, well, before we get there, I wanted to kind of talk about, again, just show some data on that. What I found interesting, um, this is again from our data diversity survey. When we ask companies, what are you planning on implementing in the next few years? And this was everything from, you'll see there, again, this is only the top 10, You'll see generative AI and data science and a lot of the self-service reporting analytics and a lot of that front end kind of sexier stuff. But the number two thing, the number one thing was data governance. And I think that speaks volumes, right? And I'll just pause there for a minute. When we, we ask the organizations across the globe and it was from, I forget, like 35 countries from all different kinds of industries, it's not generative AI and, and all of that is the number one thing. It's governance, which I think is super important. It makes me feel slightly better because we know we need to get the data right. And then a close second is data strategy because that's, to me, it's a little bit of the carrot and stick. Data strategy is more that offense. Well, it's everything because uh, you need to be defensive as well, but it is more that business alignment, I would say then, whether it's offense or defense. And then governance is also business focused, but a little bit more on the nuts and bolts of how we get the data right. 
So I think they both fit together, but there's nuance and there's difference between them. But it was also, well, we, I could talk all day about each one of these, but I won't. Uh, but I thought that was interesting to show because I, I also think as we talk about the data governance role, the, uh, the data officer role, this, come, this, this kind of dichotomy sort of comes up a lot. So I did do some research on, on who else, how are folks defining the chief data officer role? And I thought this was interesting to kind of show the different ways we're looking at it because it isn't, I don't know, it's not a role like, I don't know, I'm a dishwasher. It's pretty clear I wash dishes. This is, it is a complex role to describe. Think back to that data strategy slide. There's a lot involved in that. So uh, I'm a huge fan of the Data Management Association or DAMA or DAMA, depending on where you live in the world. Um, but I'll be the first one to, to kind of to kind of nudge them a little bit. Um, if you look at their definition from the Dama Dictionary of Data Management, it's a corporate officer who is responsible for the managing of enterprise data assets. Kind of boring. Um, and, and if I have a criticism of data, Dama, and it's not a true criticism, and I'll explain why, it's that they're a little dry and boring, and it's on the nuts and bolts of how you do, do data management. And to that, I say, well, Donna, it's in the name. They do data management don't you know get get down on them and i think my analogy might be there's accounting right and there's principles of accounting and there's methodologies to keep people's books straight and there's a whole industry on that absolutely fine that's kind of what dama is for data management how do you get your nuts and bolts right of dama that's very different from an entrepreneur right so if i hire an accountant to balance my books and I give that person a hard time because they're not visionary and understanding how I can transform my business. Well, they're an accountant. They know how to manage things. So I think that is the difference between data management and something like a chief data officer or data strategy, right? And, and so again, I'm not, I'm not knocking DAMA for being that. They're sort of the accountants of the data world. They may not be, and they're not sort of designed to be the strategists of the data world, right? And I think that's the challenge with the CDO of, you know, is the chief financial officer visionary? Or are they doing the accounting, right? So I went to good old fashioned, not old fashioned, but good old Wikipedia. Um, and they're a little bit more broad. They're responsible for enterprise-wide data governance and the utilization of information as an asset, right? So I think, and, and gosh, we could talk all day, the difference between data management, data governance, and there, there is a difference. Um, but if we kind of put governance and management in, in the same bucket for now, bear with me, I think it, Wikipedia at least is kind of showing that I have the accountant and I have the entrepreneur in the same hat, which is why it makes the chief data officer so valuable, right? I mean, that, that is how C-level roles work, right? If I'm a CEO, I should understand the workings of the company and be visionary. Like that's kind of what's expected in a C-level role. But I think speaking to that is really helpful. Um, another view on that, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with the US uh, federal government CBO uh, council and uh, they've actually done a lot in the U.S. government with this idea of a chief data officer is actually a requirement in, uh, in many cases to have a chief data officer and they kind of just called it out. It's you're enabling data driven decision decisions in a whole bunch of ways. <laughs> and then they, you'll see they list it out and there's a whole lot more on their website, etc. But I think that kind of speaks to it's a lot <laughs> and and to spell that all out in a quick definition uh, might be too much. But I think they actually have done amazing things. When I when I go to a lot of the conferences, often it's folks from the government who are really impressing me with some of the stuff they've done um, because and, and to be fair, they kind of are having this network of this community of sharing ideas, um, etc. So. Um, I, I mentioned I'm a fan of Gartner's definition, so I kind of looked what they're saying about the chief data officer role. And I, I, I like what they're saying here, that where they're combining accountability and information, yeah, I can talk today, <laughs> information protection and privacy, um, all of the things that are in that framework, also with the exploration of data assets to create business value. So again, it's it's kind of like what the federal government said with a little more conciseness and, and, and specificity here at the same time. It's all the data management stuff and it's all the visionary stuff all in one, one person, right? That was in 2015, so that's a little dated. If you look um, at the 2024, they've actually now changed the role to the chief data and analytics officer, which I find interesting. They also say it's synonymous with the chief data officer. Uh, but if you look at some of the highlights, it's accountability for value creation by means of data and analytic assets. And I thought that was an interesting distinction before 
Um, a lot of the previous, uh, if you look kind of the evolution of the definition, it went from the DEMA of managing data assets. Again, I don't tease them too much, that's what they do. But even Gartner before it was in 2015, managing data and then getting value from it. Here it's kind of flipped that script where it's get value from the data. Oh, and by the way, do it well and be accountable for it. But it's really more about the value. And there is that focus on the analytics side. If you remember back to the data diversity slide from the survey, um, what's the number one thing people are looking to do with their data? Analytics and, and, they, and reporting and AI and all that stuff. It's kind of the front end. So the, the Gartner kind of switched and put that first. Whether I fully agree with that or not, I, I'm kind of on the fence, um, but I think that's an interesting distinction. So um, which sort of led me to thinking, um, where do chief data officers come from? Um, and I've seen this a lot in my experience, and it kind of speaks to that double-headed aspect, the, the two faces of the chief data officer. I see a lot of data governance leads really grow into the um, chief data officer role. And I, I I say, but I say all this with a grain of salt, because all of this has nuance. But really, the, the data governance lead is responsible for the accountability of the data assets. It is a defense focus. That's sort of what governance does. However, if you've heard me talk about data governance, I'm always saying focus on the offense. And a good data governance lead is a community builder, a culture builder, and shows folks the value of data and why then you need to be accountable for it. So yes, it's a defense, but a good data governance lead that's going to have the opportunity to turn into a chief data officer, it's those personality traits that I think help them get there, right? Because they're really a community builder. On the data analytics lead is another role I often see, and that makes sense too, because they're often responsible for that driving insight part, and that's often more offense. And yes, you can have defensive reports too. I mean, all of these are just generalizations. You know, audit reports are kind of defense and they're still reporting. But I think as a, you know, a broad brush, kind of analytics is often used for that offense, the excitement, the AI and things like that, right? Um, I think both kind of merge into one role with the chief data officer where yes, you need to understand. So the analytics person may need to get a little heavier on the governance stuff and the data management stuff and vice versa. The data governance lead may need to kind of push off into more of that analytics lead. I think both, what would make both of these roles even without becoming a chief data officer successful is that they, they require a mix of business and technical acumen, right? So the governance, to do governance, you need to understand the business and to do data, good data analytics. It's not about just getting the bits and bytes. It's about understanding the business value and, and what you can offer. So I thought there's similar, although there are very different roles, there's similarities and the type of person that's really gonna succeed and then turn those skills into the chief data officer. So I, I found this one interesting as well. This actually comes um, from a, a fairly new report, actually, from 2020 um, uh, on the, the CDO's agenda for 2024. Um, if folks know Richard Wang at the end, he actually has a, a chief data officer um, conference every year in, in MIT and does a lot through MIT with chief data officer stuff. So uh, another good resource. So it's varied. And, and, and this actually felt right to me. <laughs> it's the gut feel uh, backing up the data, I guess. Um, it, according to them, 20% of chief data officers report to the CEO or the chair chairperson, right? That should be uh, really where a chief data officer sits. If it's, it's a chief, it really should be up at the top. I think the C-level kind of can be varied across different organizations based on size and scale and culture and that sort of thing. So just about the same amount, 20-ish across most of these, um, they about 20% reported to the CIO or the CTO. To me, that had kind of a a, a, a technical feel, right? They, they, they're seen as a technical role. And the other 20% um, kind of reported up to other C-level businessy or business-focused role. I found that interesting. That felt about right um, because I, it's just not embedded. It, it's both, right? Data is both. That's always a question. Is, is data a business thing or a techie thing? Yes. And that's what makes data unique and a little different. I think as things evolve, it may be more common to report up to the CEO and, and we'll get more used to that idea of um, that the data is both business and tech combined. It's a thing in and of itself, right? And then the other is a little less than 20 on this one, like 16%. Um, they're not yet seen as a C-level role. They might report to a non-C-level executive. To me, that feels like 
it, it's just we're, we're early in that maturity cycle or we're, we're misusing that word. It could just be, you know, a lot of massive companies have more levels and things like that. But that felt to me that's an area of maybe growth where we want the chief data officer to truly be an officer <laughs> and have that. But I thought that was an interesting kind of piece of data to kind of, um, yeah, just think, especially if you are in the CDO role, to think or I'd be curious in the chat um, where people report up to today. So uh, this is another, some data about this stuff uh, from that trends in data management report. And then this question was, who drives data management in your organization? Um, one, it kind of speaks to, it takes a village because this was a select all that apply. So in one sense that there's a diverse group in some ways it's a good thing because there's a lot of voices. Um, I thought it was interesting too, that we kind of see our cast of characters. We've, we've mentioned already the data governance lead, the chief data officer, and the data analytics leader are kind of up there in the top. I won't talk to the data architect being up the top because I talk enough about them. Huge fan of data architects and the role, but not part of this <laughs> webinar. Um, the chief information officer I found interesting. That's to me, and I think we're so used to it now, we almost stop to think, don't think about that. Where I, I usually think of CIO is IT or tech and, and IT is information technology. And then I often say, but data is not IT, it's different. And the word information, I think is misleading, right? Uh, it's not so information management, or maybe it is in, in this role, but that one seemed like that was a little high. That's just my color commentary. Um, but I thought that was interesting because it kind of speaks to A, these are some of the roles that evolve into a CDO if it's not the CDO, like the analytics leader or the data governance lead. And B, if you are a chief data officer, one of your other hats, other than, and I'm giving you a little credit here that it is a hard job, um, understanding analytics, understanding business vision and drivers, understanding data architecture and all the pieces that go into it and managing people and being a visionary and building that data-driven culture, which there are people who do all and they're successful CDOs, um, but that's a bit of a unicorn person and why that's challenging, right? You can be super techie and, and want to do the analytics, you know, the math, but but not really want to talk to people and vice versa. I'm really convincing and I want to talk with people, but don't make me touch a spreadsheet or, a, no, I said spreadsheet, to <laughs> touch a dashboard or a database, right? Um, so uh, I think that leads to this, which is, this is from that CDO Agenda article when this was a, in, in 2024, a survey of, and you'll see they kind of use that chief data and analytics officer. So whether that's gonna be a new trend, they kind of put it in parentheses for now, but we'll see if that sticks. Um, what are your biggest challenges? And you'll see the ones that are marked there with the blue dot are the people-y things, right? Um, difficulty in changing behaviors, absence of a data-driven culture, lack of data literacy, lack of support from other senior execs. That's all the people-y part. Um, the one I'll give people credit for is the fourth one from the bottom unclear or overly broad job definition. Yep, it's pretty broad. It may it evolve into several roles in the future or have larger organizations. You know, the CFO doesn't do accounts receivable and accounts payable. <laughs> they have teams for that. So again, I just think we're early um, and maybe that'll evolve over time. Um, but yeah, generative AI was, was low on the list and the biggest thing talks about the people, right? It's all about people. Uh, as long as I've been in the data industry and love being technical, I'll agree with that. It's really about getting the culture. So um, kind of just start wrapping up. I, I do want to talk to this, especially if you are a chief data officer, this idea of organizational change management. This is just one slide on it. Um, you'll see there in the notes, uh, if you're not familiar with things like ProSci or you know, there's a lot of other change management um, methodologies. They go great. This could be webinar after webinar on just that topic. But just to summarize it, the CDO role should impact the culture of the organization from a data perspective. Um, and that it happens at many levels. And in some ways, this kind of mirrors that maturity assessment. We kind of start at the individual. How are people's, what's the, the what's in it for me, right? How is this going to help me? How is it going to affect me? Am I afraid that this is going to hurt my job or get rid of my job? Or, or is analytics and data seen as the new cool thing that everyone should be doing, right? It starts at the individual. But then at the project level, you're going to have those same types of questions. Are you going to stop my project with governance? Are you going to help my project with governance? Are you going to help my project with analytics? Or are you just going to look over my shoulder with analytics and, and yell at me if I don't do well, right? 
uh, that, that was one customer we worked with. And their biggest challenge when we actually had workshops and thought it through, they said, you know what? We've always used analytics to be punitive, right? We track people's KPIs and then punish them if they didn't make it. And then you wonder why people don't want to be data-driven. And that was like for, for them and me, actually a big light bulb moment, right? So what's the light bulb moment at each, each one of these, the individual, the product, and then the org, right? You don't start by being a data-driven org and start at the org level. It takes all these steps, right? Are the people, the project, yourself, and then the org, right? And then I may be... Um, just kind of thinking on that last one or the industry again amazon's not paying me but a lot of you know think of amazon facebook um a, a lot yahoo even a lot of these companies that sort of started out as the data companies have open sourced a lot of their algorithms and things so they really are not only creating a data-driven culture of their company but after they get to a certain point have actually done some things of giving back to the community or a lot of the open source um environments out there or, or a lot of a lot of the algorithms and things that are out there and made available are amazing today of things you can do. So I think it goes beyond just the organization. So uh, something to think of again could be a whole webinar, but that is maybe not the thing you'd think of when you got the job of the chief data officer. Is like great, I'm going to start building culture and people, and but it is right. So um, something to think of as especially as we saw that that was one of the biggest challenges. So uh, just to sum up, you know, no surprise that more than ever data is driving the global economy and the organizations that see the value are really in a place to transform their the business. And I, I do say organization because it isn't only businesses, it's nonprofits, it's hospitals, it's schools, it's um, research organizations, et cetera. Um, and that role of the chief data officer is firmly in the center of all of this business transformation, which makes us exciting but it's, it's new. And again, I mentioned this idea of an entrepreneur. You really, in a way, are because you're in uncharted territories. How do we use generative AI? And how do I you know, govern the right areas of data? And so if that's exciting to you, it's an amazing job. It can also be overwhelming <laughs> so, because it is. It's that offense of business value and then being really careful with defense as well. And that makes that CDO role a really healthy balance of that business acumen also tech and people, right? So, and if you are a CDO and, and as you think amongst yourself, you probably have, uh, if that's a triangle of, of business, tech and people, you probably have a point in that triangle you feel more comfortable in and maybe, you know, it start hard to work on that other point. I'm really great at people, but I, I don't get the tech. I need to up my tech or vice versa. I'm really great at the tech, but mm, I really haven't thought of my culture building. Can I take some courses or, or kind of push myself there? So some things to think of. Hopefully that gave some ideas uh, for, for thought for yourself. Um, if this was of interest to you next month on this webinar, this was a bit about the role and the person and the, the I guess the role of, of the chief data officer in business transformation. Next month, we'll talk more about what does that even mean to be a data-driven organization and what are some of those values and what, you know, at that organizational and, and kind of business level. So uh, we do this for a living at Global Data Strategy. Shameless plug, if you need help, we're happy to help. Um, and then I will pass it over to Shannon to open it up for Q&A. Anna, thank you so much, as always, for this great presentation. Uh, lots of questions coming in. If you have questions for Donna, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. Uh, and just answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording to everybody. So diving in here, Donna, um, so what do you say to organizations that only have a CIO because information be comes from data and the organization might think they already have a data lead with their CIO? Yeah, great question. And I, I kind of touched, I don't know when that came in, I kind of touched on that when I talked about the CIO role. It can be, that's when I get a brand new client that's brand new to this, um, and we're kind of in the room uh, and they're just able to ask anything they've been wanting to ask without it being judged. Um, I get that question a lot. Where does data sit? Is it IT? Is it in the business? What is it? Um, and and it, it's different at every role, but I, I've had some light bulbs going off at every company. I mean, uh, with, with explaining that, that there's an IT component or a relationship with data, but data is a separate thing. And that's been a light bulb for a lot of folks. Um, so you may, I mean, again, with that reporting structure, if there's a data team within IT, um, 
that's fine. But yeah, they're they're generally different um, and supporting to each other. Um, but it may not be enough just to have a head of IT, depending on what that person's skills are. Sure. So Donna, could you provide other examples of level five companies aside from Bloomberg uh, and Uber? Oh, uh, I would say, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna, no. Uh, well, I would think Facebook, all, all of the social media, right? Those, those are kind of, again, data-driven graph databases and things behind, behind the scenes. I would say a lot of the FinTech companies, um, what is it, Robin Hood or whatever, a lot of those kind of those, those trading apps, again, those are all based on data. Um, I'm trying to think of even a- Someone suggested Walmart. You know, yeah. Walmart, yeah. I I was gonna put Walmart as a. I think they're somewhere between a four and a five. I think because the difference is they're very optimized for, and they kind of grew up as a a place, uh, as a place that made sense as a product company. Um, maybe the reason I said not because they didn't start as digitally native. Whereas, like, think of an Amazon. I think his his goal was I have the data and I'm gonna build a company around it. Or if Walmart grew the other way, but yeah, they're pretty awesome at what they do with data. So if they're not a five, they're a four dot seven or something like that. Um, I was trying to think of a kind of a non pro. Well, I'm working with we work with one company just to kind of keep it. It doesn't have to be always a for profit. They were doing a lot of AIDS and COVID research, and they started a consortia across the globe for kind of real world data sets, and we're doing research. And I think that was a five because it was data first, right? Let's get the data and then do research off the data. Um, so I just wanted to throw in kind of a non profit example there too. Yeah, and you just kind of touched on this a little bit for the next question. You know, for most companies, aren't there diminishing returns with achieving a level five maturity unless you're a Fortune 50 company? Isn't achieving a level three an acceptable level for the vast majority? Um, I think that's a really fair question. So when I work with my customers, I say, you get to pick whether you're a three, four or five, you can be, it depends what your goal is, right? And I'll, I'll give an analogy. We work with two manufacturing companies in a very similar industry at the same time. That seems to happen a lot. And I'm not sure why. Um, one absolutely wanted to be a three. They said, we've been in business for a hundred years. We sell, I'll just say widgets. We want to do it better. We want to be more efficient, but we're not, you you guys are the techie guys. I don't want to do that. I want to sell widgets better. They were fine. They were continued to be profitable. And we also work with another company in the same industry. And they said, well, we have an industry that fluctuates. We want to look at our data and actually have a kind of a spinoff and have new data products from our company. And, and they did that as well. And they were both successful. So I don't know if it's diminishing returns, but it's a, it's a choice. It doesn't, you don't, you can be successful <laughs> at any level. Um, and it really depends on your business and what your goals are. So yeah, great question. You don't have to not, and I would say most companies do not want to be a five. Don't, don't wait. you probably want to be a three or a four just to optimize your company. Unless you, I'll tell one more story and then I'll, and I'm going to run out of time, but I work with a big insurance company, a, a big insurance company, and they were trying to be more data driven uh, and have a customer centric model. And they couldn't, they, after they looked at their data, they basically said, we know policies. We don't know people that the way our data is structured, it, it takes more effort than it's worth. And they actually started a new company, a new startup to almost compete with themselves. Um, so they had both. They had the level three company that did kind of the legacy and they started a brand new company to try to be level five. But that was pretty extreme. It doesn't happen a lot, uh, but that they wanted to kind of get into insure tech. And they said, we can't do it with our existing structure. So they had a successful three and they had a successful five at the same time. Right, we've got less than two minutes, but I'm going to slip this last question in because I, I I was curious myself. I'm glad they this question was asked. What's your vision of the AI uh, as the new role combining CDO and AI as the new CDAIO? You just wanted to say CDAIO. Isn't that like yeah, e yeah. <laughs> Um I think, <laughs> now I can't say it without laughing. Um, yeah, I think if we get to that many acronyms, let's change the title into the data officer or something. Um uh, let's just change the title into something else. But um, yeah, AI is definitely in the purview of the chief data officer, um, as is analytics, as is security and everything else. Apologies. Uh, but yeah, I think it's definitely the purview. I don't think it's worth changing the title because we don't say chief reporting and analytics and AI and governor's office. You run out of things. But yeah, definitely if you're a CDO and you're not thinking of AI, you should be. Um, whether, whether it makes sense or not, that's I think we need to be realistic with those things. Some funny comments in the chat. AIO, the old uh, 
McDonald's had a farm. Yeah. A I O A I O. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it, but funny. Um, all right. Well, thank you everybody. And thanks Donna for such a great presentation. And, uh, as always and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do again just a reminder i will send a follow-up email by end of day monday for this webinar to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording donna thank you so much thank you very much thanks y'all have a great day